What's really good, everybody? This is Nathan Alabach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. A uh, quick update, I have been hammering away at this new book on internet culture the past couple months. The working title is Extremely Online Mapping Internet Culture, Memes, and Media. And it's about a month away, I'd say, from a first workable draft. So, uh, yeah, sorry for being so on and off the radar lately. I've just been carving out a ton of time researching for this thing on top of work. And I tend to work best with a singular focus. So, of course, the podcast has kind of fallen by the wayside because I suck. Anyway, so all that to say, this is the second to last episode left in my backlog and then we'll be up to speed. Now, for today's guest, I had the pleasure of speaking with Iona Italia. Iona is an author, translator, writer for Aereo Magazine, and podcast host of Two for Tea. And she's based in Buenos Aires, actually. She's also a cultural commentator and a critic, which you can get a window into with her articles on Aereo, or just with her Twitter feed, where she talks about politics and psychology and free speech and just a whole range of other interesting topics. Uh, In our conversation, we talked about what led Iona to becoming more active in like just online political discourse in general, Uh, the landscape of ideological groups from far left to far right today. And we touched on a bunch of public intellectuals in this space that we both follow. It's uh, really interesting just because we're both actually fairly similar in our overall outlook, but I'd say we come to subtly different assessments in some areas. Uh, Anyway, this talk was a blast, and it actually went much longer than we planned for, so we covered a lot of ground. There were moments of the recording where Iona's signal was lost or lagging a little bit, Uh, so there's some miscommunication flubs here and there, but overall came out great, and I hope you enjoy it. Now let's get into what's really good. Iona, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Hey, so for people who maybe aren't as familiar with your work, could you uh, just briefly describe who you are and what you do? Yes. So I am um, uh, actually, no, I'm not really sure how to describe myself. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Uh, so like, what have you, like, what's your history in so far as academia and how did you come into your work currently with Aereo and your commentary and online culture? So I was an academic uh, in, so I did my PhD in English literature And I wrote my thesis and then I later enlarged it. I more or less sort of doubled it and made it into a book, um, which was on 18th century essays. Mm. The book is called Anxious Employment. That was published by Routledge in 2005. And then in 2006, I moved to Buenos Aires and I actually left academe. And I trained as a tango dancer. I worked as a professional tango teacher for a while. Then I started, uh, I became the sub-editor for ARIO about, I guess, about six months ago. And I also am running now the ARIO Magazines podcast, which everybody should check out. It's called Two for Tea. So that's what's happening yeah, and the podcast is great. I've been listening to the first few episodes of it. So what was the uh, initial catalyst to get you back into the political sphere? Like, I noticed you've been kind of circling in certain uh, online circles on Twitter the past couple years, but recently there's definitely been an uptick since you uh, joined Area. So was there a specific event or moment that got you more into uh, this sort of political sphere of conversation? Um, I think I, I entered the political political sphere of, co- of conversation when I joined uh, or when I rejoined Twitter. I actually opened the account quite a while ago, but um, then I didn't 
Um, I didn't really understand how Twitter worked. I sent off a few tweets and nobody was following me or paying any attention. <laughs> so I thought, but what is the point of this? Right. So I stopped using Twitter and um, I started using it again, um, I guess, about three years ago now. Gosh, is it really three years? <laughs> Two and a half years, maybe. And... I quickly discovered that on Twitter, people are only interested in politics. Yes. So if you want to converse with people, you have to talk about politics. And so I did. And then I, uh, Malhar Mali, who used to edit Ario magazine, was following me on Twitter. And he found my tweet threads quite interesting. At that time, I think I had about... 80 followers or something, mm -hmm. a very small number. And he asked me if I would review um, a film for Ario. It was called The Red Pill. It's a film about the men's rights movement. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And after that, I wrote a few other pieces for Ario and also for uh, Canatus News. And I became friendly with Helen Pluckrose, and started following her. Um, we started following each other and uh, interacting a lot on Twitter. And then when Helen took over the editorship of Ario from Malhar, about, yeah, about six months ago, she hired me to be the sub-editor. Super cool. Yeah, I mean, I've really, I've been enjoying your social commentary on Twitter the past few months, just because I, I love the way you engage with people, because you can tell from the way you write that your form of conversation isn't, it's almost like you're too nuanced for Twitter, because you're always trying to write like past the uh, the Twitter character limit, which is something that I do. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do the same I'm too thing. I fake for Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a huge problem, and like I I talk about this a lot on the show and just with uh, friends and social circles of mine, just how it's it's definitely um, indicative of society as a whole. But I think specifically on Twitter, how it's everything is geared to fit within those character limits, and it really pushes those sound bites that everybody wants. Everybody wants you to have a very specific point of view and to push a very specific party line. And when you're trying to respond to something with any level of nuance, it's really hard to say anything at all and to gain any type of audience with what you're saying. So with your approach, like how, how would you describe your political identity at this point? And, like, do you have any specific goals in being on Twitter, like, with your social commentary? So my, my goal really is to be able to earn some money from um, my political commentary, mm. I guess, and to at least uh, supplement my income a little bit um, through the ARIO editing, through my own writing for ARIO and through the podcast. I'm trying to build that because I would... I would prefer to spend my time um, doing that. And I also write about dance. Um, I have quite a large following for my dance-related blog. And I would prefer to spend my time doing those more creative things than to, at this point, having just having just returned from India uh, to Buenos Aires. Um, I would prefer to be able to do that than to have to go and get an office job because I feel that I have more... I feel my talent, I have some talents in that direction and I find it fun. Mm. So that's my aim. I'd like to build a following. But I also, um, Twitter has been largely a positive experience for me. I don't know how wise it is that I'm on Twitter uh, under my real name. So potential employers or clients can uh, search for me. I rely rather heavily on the fact that most of my real life friends are not on Twitter and also that most employers here don't speak, um, don't really speak good enough English to be interested in following right. my English language writing. But that may be rather foolhardy. I do wonder whether, whether you know, um, being non-anonymous on Twitter was a stupid thing to do or whether it's a wise thing to do. I haven't, I haven't really yet decided and on the whole, it has been a very positive experience for me. So I find that Twitter is extremely useful if you want to make new friends. So Facebook is for staying in touch with friends you already have who live overseas. Mm -hmm. And 
um, who you would otherwise not be able to keep in touch with or definitely not that number of people. Yeah. There are probably about 200 people who I want to stay in regular touch with. And I'm not realistically going to Skype that many people or write letters to them regularly. So Facebook uh, gives me a chance to stay in touch but and to also meet people who are already from that circle, who are friends of friends, who are fellow dancers, etc. Right. But Twitter really exposes you to everybody. And if you want to expand your circle of acquaintances and you want to talk to people who um, live in places you've never been to and have no connection with, who are in the kinds of careers that you know nothing about, then it's extremely useful. And most of my friends in, um, actually, all all the friends that I made in India, I encountered either on Facebook or through Twitter. So my real life friends in India, I encountered first on social media. Super interesting. Yeah, I love how honest your assessment was just going back a couple of minutes of just like how, how and why you're getting more involved in social commentary and just how that is sort of like you're using it as a catalyst to build some type of, not career necessarily, but some outlet to make some money doing something that you're good at doing. And like I think that that alone, that sort of admittance to just being transparent in what you're doing and who you are. Because I think that's something that for a lot of people online, whether they have a YouTube channel or a podcast or even if it's just a website with a platform, they tend to cover up their intentions and with just kind of trying to come off like they're not trying to sell you something. Whereas like at the end of the day, like each one of us are online to sell something like we're whether we just want attention from people or we're trying to get clicks for our website or we're trying to push some type of ad. You know, it's really it's cool that you're able to just be upfront about like who you are and like what you're trying to do. And I definitely think that through Twitter specifically, it's it is in an interesting time just in online culture in general how culturally we're starting to value transparency through social media there like there's certain aspects of it where when somebody comes out or somebody speaks up about mental illness or some specific uh cultural event then it's deemed as heroic and we can get behind it and say this is really great and it's more transparent. But at the same time, you're right, there is this sort of hesitation because there's no telling at this point what the future is going to look like with people and how they perceive what's being written online. Because we all know like each decade that goes past when we look at the stuff that people wrote online, we all kind of look at it through this lens of just, whoa, what were we thinking back then so it's kind of it puts us in this weird <laughs> spot for sure where it, we have to kind of constantly be measuring what we're saying and how we're coming across and and all that well i think you know i have a policy of of radical honesty and that's probably an extremely unwise policy <laughs> um and you know some uh People on Twitter have told me the important thing is to build your brand yeah. and you have to be careful about how you present yourself. And I certainly have some friends, real life friends who are who agonize over uh, a post that they make on Facebook. Most yeah. of them are not on Twitter um, or who have beautiful Instagram accounts in F of you know a, a daily selfie of themselves with perfect immaculate makeup uh always looking absolutely perfect and i just um i temperamentally am very opposed to that and that's probably a bad thing because i tend to just let dirty linen um i tend to let dirty underwear hang on the line <laughs> or you know clean underwear i guess yeah right either or <laughs> washed <laughs> underwear <laughs> um you know i tend to leave knickers on the radiator and i um so i try to talk very honestly uh both on twitter and even on my facebook blog even though that does mean you know, if you are honest about your own vulnerabilities, there are, of course, people who, I don't know if I would say exploit that, but who are kind of 
take that as evidence that you are a bad person. So right. I get people saying things like, you apologize to somebody for um, writing an over hasty, angry tweet. This shows that you are really, um, the fact that you had to apologize shows that you're really immature. And um, Or, you know, I saw that you were posting that you were feeling depressed. I'm really happy you're feeling depressed because I hate you. It makes me really gleeful to know that you're yes. sad. And um, it's, so I feel as though it's very easy to get, to allow ourselves to be swayed by those kinds of opinions, mm -hmm. to feel like I mustn't post anything that will make me look vulnerable because these people who are already sort of um, uh, malicious types are going to be lying there and wait to pounce on that. But, you know, I think we shouldn't make what we allow ourselves to say dependent upon um, people who don't care about us. Right. Yeah, I, tr I think that um, you can build better relationships in the long run if you are very honest in the way you present yourself. And obviously every self-presentation is curated, even if you try to write the most, the rawest autobiography, it's always fictionalized. Yep. You know, you're always shaping and forming. But I try to stay with the most honest version and although that that has its disadvantages it also there are a lot of rewards to that yeah. and it also means that i'm not able to be exposed because everything is already out there exactly you've already exposed yourself so and i i love that and i i follow a similar line of thinking where it's just People are going to, there's always going to be trolls and cr critics who are looking to exploit those vulnerable parts of who you are in some manner. And it's best to just own it, you know, just keep, keep the windows open in your house. And, you know, it's, it does, it is a shame that the, like, if you do give too much ammunition, then yeah, it can easily be used against you in some way, but you're right. I think in the long run, it's just a better way to establish relationships and who you are. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, we do all choose the content we put online. So we're kind of painting the the picture of ourselves in whichever way we want but at the same time we get to we as people who are trying to put ideas out there it's best to be as honest about our motivations and where we're coming from as we can just to give the the listeners and the people receiving that information more context so anyway just, just to just kind of jump into this a little bit, could you briefly maybe get into how you describe your political views at this point? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to answer that. No, you're fine. Answer the question. How would I describe my um, political views? Yeah. So I think my views have not really changed uh, terribly much. The last time my views changed substantially was, I think, when I went to university. So when I was, um, I guess, when I first became aware of politics, that was probably during the Falklands War. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I was too or during the Falklands War, um, <laughs> clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that I was um, pretty much an old school communist until, I, until about age 18, 19. And then I started... Um, uh, my views became a little milder, but I would say I have been um, a left-leaning person all of my life. So I have continued. I, I'm. I mean, I am a capitalist, so I think that capitalism is necessary for wealth creation, and communism clearly does not work. It's not a system that's compatible with human nature. But I am in favor of a strong welfare state. I think it's important to have a strong infrastructure. I think it's better to live in a society in which most people are not living in utter poverty and misery. And I actually, I recently listened to Sam Harris's interview with, the episode was called Digital Humanism. Oh, was it with... Uh, um that guy, he's a tech guy, Jer Jaron somebody? Jaron Lanier, yeah. or Jaron Lanier, I don't know how to pronounce it, actually. Um, and he said that 
even from the point of view of somebody who is extremely rich like himself, he doesn't want to live in a society in which he would have to be cordoned off in a in a gated community with armed guards at the door mm. because other people out in the street are desperate or where you you know you would go in your limo from one kind of gated off place to another because the general street and the general atmosphere outside in the city would be so miserable. Right. And it's worth, even if you feel you wouldn't directly benefit from it yourself, it's worth paying the money to live in the kind of society where, for example, other people have at least a reasonable level of education, other people are reasonably healthy, other people are not in this kind of desperate poverty. Um, and to live in a place in which you can just, you can cycle because the cycle paths are maintained, you can take public transport, that in which the the, the kind of whole society is looked after, not just the individual. So I would say that that is very much the basis of my left-wing politics. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds like, I mean, from what I gather, just on following you on Twitter and listening a bit to your podcast, it sounds a bit like, you know, you're someone you identify on the left, but you sort of follow that mantra of wanting to clean up your own house, like, per se, and and I think I think a lot of people, uh, at least in this sort of deep online culture space uh, within within the politics, are just a bit disenfranchised by that attitude because of like the Dave Rubin model, which is like essentially, you know, Dave Rubin. I, I've talked about him a lot on this show. Is seen by many as someone who you know identifies on the left and has for a long time, but at least in the past couple of years has been basically shilling for a uh, right wing politics in a lot of ways. So I mean like how how do you personally stay true to your values in this space that's constantly trying to pull you in one direction or another? Um there are people on the left who spend their time uh critiquing the right. Um and I find that I think that's perfectly valid. So one of my best friends tweets and writes on Facebook always about uh, Trump and the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And I frankly just do not want to follow the Trump administration that closely. And, you know, since no one is paying me to do so, I I choose where I put my attention. Um, and I don't want to place my attention on listening to Trump speeches every day. So I don't, um, I don't follow with the kind of close, close attention that you need if your main focus is going to be critiquing the administration. Mm. And that does not mean I'm a fan of the administration at all. I'm really, you know, um, you what there? other kind of stupid... Oh, I, I yes, lost I'm you. Here? You were in the middle of saying uh, it's the worst, I think. It's I, So <laughs> I think he's the worst pre, uh, president who could have been possibly elected. But I don't want to spend my time... Um, and attention focusing on him. Right. Um, and I am really what I'm most interested in is language. I am, my background is in English literature, and I always especially loved close reading, what we call practical criticism, which is closely analyzing the wording that people use. And I'm really fascinated by the phenomenon of the social justice left. I'm fascinated by the the ways in which they are manipulating language. So that's what I choose to focus on. I'm very critical of it, but I focus on it also because it interests me. So I feel that both are valid. There is critiquing the other side and there is cleaning up your own house, and both are valid, but my preference is cleaning up my own house. Mm. I'm really um, sickened by what is going on in the right. I don't want to place my focus there. But um, if not, I will choose what I do, and I will choose not to do that. Um, and I feel that on the right as well, um, there are valid ways of critiquing the left. And there is also this kind of just babyish sort of triggering the lips behavior. Right. 
So there are two different things, I think slightly different behaviors from the left and the right, both of which I find extremely counterproductive and silly. On the left, it's mostly extreme social justice types who I think are a very vocal and bullying minority, um, just attacking other left not being pure enough or for not parroting exactly the right slogans, for not using the right terminology, for not um, for not towing the line ideologically. Mm. Um, so this kind of purity pogroms are a lot of really silly enough. And there are a lot of people on the, the right is very, is on the right people don't tend to do that to their own. So they don't tend to take people who are clearly on their own side, but are just not, are saying the same thing, but maybe not wording it in the exact same manner. Um, the right don't tend to, to do that kind of internal cannibalism. But what they do do many of them is um, this very silly sort of triggering the lips thing, where they just want to poke fun at people on the left and what's going wrong on their own side. I find that very annoying. And whenever I'm criticizing the social justice left, um, I have right-wingers appear in my mentions on Twitter, ha, 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 whatever, come forever. I usually tell them to, can I swear this? Oh, yeah, you're good. <laughs> um, I actually tell them to fuck off because um, I find that very childish behavior. And I think this is the almost my only point of one of my few points has been with Jordan Peterson, whose ideas I largely um, dislike and disagree with. But I, um, I do find his little slogan quite useful, clean your room, bucko. <laughs> you know, that's what I want to tell them. Go tidy your own room. It's a pig guy in there. <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I'm glad you uh, defined the uh, the social justice left the way you did after getting into how specifically you're interested in language and how we define these different terms and these groups because I think that's so helpful in how we're identifying the people that we're direct, directing our attention toward because the way I see it at least, you know, people – People don't tend to define terms specifically. They define them broadly. So you hear a lot of people use language like the right or the left. And generally that's not great for communicating because, you know, it's just a generalization and it perpetuates tribal biases. But I do tend to think, sort of kind of going off what you said there, I tend to think that using the term the right generally speaking, is a little bit more appropriate because they're a much more organized uh, group as a whole. Like, I think I think as soon as you cross the center line into, like, libertarianism and conservatism, and then you keep going further down the line into, you know, fun, like, more strong conservative values and, uh, you know, all the way down to fascism, a lot of the people who align in these different subcategories within the right-wing movement, they often agree with each other, they share platforms, they vote on the same policies, and and like you said, they don't really eat their own in a way. Whereas when you look on the left, it's a much larger um, fractioned uh, segment of people. Like as soon as you go past the center line, from what I've noticed at least, you have everything starting from your kind of corporate centrist Democrats to your leftist progressive types to social justice warriors. And then you have, or I should just say social justice oriented people who can veer into the whole social justice warrior mindset. Mm, mm. And then you go further left than that. You go into these uh, like su subsets of socialism and communism and Marxism. And then even further down the line, you get to anarchism and just trolls. Mm. So I think mm. it's really, it's good to be able to sort of define who we're 
talking about when we get into this nitty gritty because like especially when you get onto the world of Twitter, which is where I know you spend a lot of your time, when you start to figure out who runs these different media media platforms and organizations, you realize that so much of it on the left is very there's a lot of infighting, but it's also very self-critical because not many of them agree on the sort of policies and systematic shift changes that um, uh, the different, like specifically in America at least, that um, like American society needs to make moving forward. So like you have you have someone like an Ezra Klein who, to a Sam Harris fan, would be considered a leftist. But then Ezra Klein and uh, his media platform, Vox, is often just made fun of and shouted down by those further on the left. Like, that would be under the... like the. Cho- Are you familiar with Chapo Trap House at all? No, I have no idea. That sounds like a steak house or something. <laughs> it, that, that's a common reaction for people who haven't heard of them. They're actually... So, Chapo Trap House is... I I would go as far to say that's probably the most um, organized and funded uh, group of the far left. So they're sort of they're they're on Patreon. You can find them there. They're one of the most funded Patreons out there. I think they might be the most funded actually. But it's a group. I of, think Jordan isn't Jordan Peterson's the most funded. He might be at this point. I haven't checked recently, but he they're 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 up there as far as uh, representation. But it's it's a large group of individuals, and then they're they have like a larger um, chain of influence outside of the direct group. But their podcast has a huge reach, and like they're. They're kind of in this vein of a uh, like socialist anarchist. Um, they're very, they're very trollish in their behavior. So like the way they react to um, societal discourse is like kind of like in uprooting it. It's not so much as partaking in it. So needless to say, like a lot of people when they go to define these different subsets of a of a larger swap when you make a comment like the left or the right it's often you get lost in a lot of the the nuance of of the language and like who are we talking about like when you say the left you know who do you mean by the left like do you mean hillary clinton and the democratic party or do you mean the dsa or do you mean you know so on and so forth so and of I think course we're helpful. only talk and of course, we're only talking about America here, yeah. but we can keep it, we can um, restrict it to America for simplicity. But I mean, I think there are divisions on the right as well. So there are, um, you know, there are more moderate people who are mostly economically right. Um, and then there are religious conservatives, there are evangelical Christians, Very and there are true. Trump supporters. And I feel as though um, really with a religious conservatives and the Trump supporters, I actually cannot even talk to them. Um, So even though I find it hard to converse with people who are zealots of the social justice left, we usually can find some common ground. But with Trump supporters, I can generally find no common ground, at least once we get onto that topic. Right. Um, I can find kind of common ground with them as humans, and I have some who follow me on Twitter and who are very friendly, actually. Um, but on any political topic that any time anything to do with Trump comes up, I feel it's it's cultish mm. behavior. And I think it's actually more so, more kind of um, blinkered than uh, the social justice left, in fact. I think it's really a personality cult. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of a sort of religious guru or something. You know, Trump is the, um, is the Cheeto Osho. <laughs> well, that's a great point to make, too, just because you mentioned uh, Jordan Peterson before, and I'm very critical of him as well as a public figure. But uh, the one thing he's uh, brought into a lot of public conversations is just how different people groups have different personality traits that define how they think. And I think that a lot of like what studies have found is that people on the left or that identify generally as on the left, they're higher in, uh, I think it's conscientiousness. So 
and openness. So it's like there's there's more of like a a malleability. No, um, lower lower on conscientiousness. Lower on and higher in openness. Uh, that's it. So so Jordan Peterson suggested that right conservative campus groups schedule their speakers for really early in the morning to avoid protests. Mm. Um, I mean that would avoid protests, but they would also have no audience, of course, right. because. No student is awake before 10 a.m. But that certainly would be a way to avoid campus protests. Ben Shapiro could give all his speeches at 7 in the morning. Right, right. (laughs) So it's like in in that line, like I think we and we see this just play out in politics and in social spheres where you see it in the religious right. You see it in the Republican Party. People on the right, just from a temperamental perspective perspective they're much more organizational and structured and they're really good at rallying around the flag and and the left needs to do that i mean we need to do that at least for the voting booth um and i think maybe to some extent we do and what happens the kind of divisiveness on twitter may not matter that much i'm not sure i'm really not sure Mm. so um There is this very bad attitude among many on the social justice left that we don't need allies, Mm. i.e. to be an ally, you have to you have to be uh, an ally in exactly the way I tell you to be, which usually involves just shutting up. I think that's the most frequent thing I get from people on the social justice left. They're like, close your account, stop talking, Ugh, stop yeah. writing, just shut the fuck up. And I'm like, how is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? well, okay. I, I just, so how, how is this useful? I, um, do you really expect me to say, okay, you asked me to shut up, so now I'm going to shut <laughs> up because a random person on Twitter told me to do so? Of course not. Um, so, You know, there's this kind of idea that I hear very often, I do feel that rhetoric on the social justice left is liable to drive people towards the right. And it's not going to drive somebody like me towards the right, who is a very firm, lifelong leftist. I'm not going to vote for the, I'm not going to vote for right-wing parties. I'm not going to advocate right-wing policies because, you know, somebody called me a rude name on Twitter. Right, yeah. And, you know, I don't even agree with the more moderate people on the right. Uh, There are many people on the right who I think have feasible, reasonable views, and I can talk to them, but I still don't agree You know, there's still a fundamental disagreement there, philosophically and politically. Um, But a lot of people are more uh, in the center, are more undecided. And um, if you um, if you alienate them, then they will either stay home and not vote. I think that will be the reaction of most or they will vote for the right. Right. Um, And. I hear really often people saying, oh, well, we don't need those people. Yes, you fucking need those people (laughs) because you need, you you know, a vote is a vote. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, if they don't want to do things our way, we don't want them in our club. It's not a club, you know, it's um, voting for your and and just just talk restricting ourselves to the US for now it's voting for your president for your senators right uh you know, it's something that will affect everybody. Well, you don't an, want the left to be a small, exclusive club. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's such an unproductive way to espouse your rhetoric because not only is it, you know, it doesn't work great on a personal level, like you said. You know, if someone tells you to shut up, you're not going to shut up, and it's going it, to it has the potential to push certain people away. But also, just from the systematic level, where the social justice left, in particular, and you know, and in a lot of ways. I empathize with those people. Like, there's a lot of causes within that uh, subset that I agree with, and that I want to help prop up minority groups and do the best that we can do in order to accomplish that. But I think there is a subset within the social justice left that they don't see the the um, benefit of having allies with quote unquote privilege like they don't I, I just did a podcast with Ali Rizvi and we talked about this a little bit how you know people in the civil rights era like they needed white people in power 
to be able to prop up the black activists. And it's the same with women's suffrage movement. I mean, it's, you see it across the board. Like at the end of the day, of like a movement might start grassroots within a minority group, but at some point you have to start, whether it's through compromise or whether it's through conversations, like you have to reach out to the people in power to help gain their ear and get their attention to help get your movement off the ground. And that's definitely, it's definitely something that we're seeing, at least it's highlighted really poorly on the internet. So, and it's always, and I always feel weird even commentating on social justice stuff too much because just the way it's highlighted online specifically, like nine times out of 10, if not more than that, it's done on YouTube by some right wing channel or talk show host and it's just like taking you know one person who's probably mentally ill or at least just not a great representation of a specific group (laughs) you know what i mean so it's like yeah it's kind of hard to even be able to gauge like how many people really are there like this like is this the majority of them is this how many college campuses is, is this taking place at so yeah anyway it just it gets it's a very it's a very complicated thing to address, and I definitely... You know, it's it's an argument that people get into all the time, which is how important is a particular phenomenon? And the problem with trying to assess that, it's really hard to assess that. So there are constant arguments that go... Um, you know, this is a real problem on college campuses. You can look at the number of cases that fire um, Greg Lukianov's organization, the freedom of freedom of speech on campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm 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 not sure what the fire acronym stands for, but anyway, something something oh, yeah, in fire. education. I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Free something in education, and you can look at the number of cases they filed, uh, but then. Is that a significant number? Is it a non-significant number? What proportion is that of American universities? And there's also, uh, you know, is it a significant phenomenon or not? This is an argument I have with people all the time who say, well, the social, you know, I get people telling me constantly that the social justice left don't exist. (laughs) That basically this is three blue haired people in a Portland coffee shop and that's it. Um, and it's just something, you know, blown up by the right wing media for their own purposes. Right. And I have absolutely no doubt. In fact, I listened to an NPR um, expose on this about uh, Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA and their training programs. They actually have these training programs where they train students to um, to provoke other students and get them on camera to- of freaking out oh, geez. so that they can so that they can then post these videos later on their website um, and they were giving all people all kinds of even you know technical advice on how to do the filming and they were saying here's a script that you can use you make sure that you stay calm and polite but if you say these things or you hold up these posters then the left-wingers on campus are going to go crazy and then we'll have great footage so you know there's actually a whole industry in this um and it really i find it really silly that that some people on the left keep playing into the hands of that they're like they're they're dying you know they're they sent Ben Shapiro there partly because they're dying to see a riot. You're right. You know, they're dying to see you use noisemakers and pull the fire alarm and yeah, all that stuff. right into their narrative. Don't, you know, yep. just don't go. Let the, let Shapiro's talk be a non-event. Yeah. Um, that would be the absolute best revenge. But people are so easily baited. But I... And now I've lost, <laughs> I've completely lost track of what I was going to say. Oh, yes. People, so people tell me constantly the social justice left don't, don't exist. And people also are always telling me that the alt right doesn't exist. Mm. That's also three people. And there's no such thing as neo Nazis. You know, there haven't been any fascists around since 19, um, since, you know, 1945. Yeah. Um, and both of those are just untrue. Yeah. Both those phenomena exist. Which is larger, which is more important, and which is likely to be cause more problems in the future going forward? I really do not know, because to know that, I would need to have a crystal ball. And so talking about leftist accounts on Twitter, there are some leftist accounts which 
are completely dedicated to exposing the alt-right. And I have a lot of respect for those people. Yeah. Um, so they are not attacking other leftists over petty little disagreements. Yeah. They are, you know, um, exposing and mocking and satirizing and showing up people who are on the alt-right and far-right. That is a very legitimate target to me. Um, they're not cleaning up their own act on the left, but that's fine. What they're doing is also totally legit and helpful. But, you know, I think that um, which is more important to uh, fight against? I have no idea. I just don't know. I can't predict the future. And I find it more interesting. And for whatever reason, I'm more drawn to critiquing the social justice left. Yeah, I think I find it just more interesting, frankly. Yeah. I think there's more nuance there because there are things that I agree with and things I disagree with. Whereas on the far right, alt right, there are, I can find some common ground even there. So I'm not a fan of Islam and, you know, I can understand people's concerns about that. Yeah. But um, almost immediately the next step along their line of reasoning, I, they already lost me. Yeah. Whereas they're like, they're with talking the social... about like white ethno states, and they're just, they're talking about far right ideas. Where it doesn't just stop at criticizing the ideology. It's just like that's more of like a, a symptom of a larger cause that's like underneath the um the whole movement. Right, and I also think that their attitude towards Muslims is the most unnuanced <laughs> oh possible. God. It's just ridiculous. I hate it's. It's Absolutely so funny ridiculous. how like one of the most common talking points like within that sphere because I've I've followed the sphere for years at this point, and they always make comments like, "Well, Islam isn't a race, so you can't be bigoted against Muslims," and it's just such a silly talking point because at the end of the day when people were if we're talking about general associations with how people perceive mass groups of individuals when people perceive muslims in american culture specifically they are perceiving brown people so it doesn't mean that a white person can't be muslim anybody can be a muslim but that is like, actually i yeah actually i don't think that it's i don't think it's so much about perceiving brown people um, I think that it's a misunderstanding about how religion works. Um, so I feel that um, I am very, very anti-Islam, which is not, you know, not a popular stance on the left. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really, I'm very... I'm very much not a fan of, of any form of extremist um, religion. Right. Um, I'm not, um, and I'm not an atheist, uh, but I'm not devout. And I don't get on well with people who are devout, who can't, you know, who have the kind of attitude towards their religion that it cannot be satirized or mocked. Yeah. Um, and um, who are, as soon as I feel that kind of touchiness or this sort of aspiration to a special sanctity, mm -hmm. um, I find that very, very off-putting, including in Zoroastrianism, although I am a Parsi yeah. myself. Um, but I do, I do find Islam a particularly dangerous religion at this point in history. Um, and a particularly, and, and it's dangerous also because it's a very lean, mean religion. Right. Um, it's, it's, succinct and concise and um, and very clear. But at the same time, you cannot, if you know somebody is Muslim, you cannot find out who that person is, what they are like by reading the Quran. Um, you, there's no, there's no shortcut to getting to know the person because every type of, every way of being Muslim exists from just being culturally Muslim and growing up in a Muslim family, um, to, um, and not you know necessarily declaring yourself ex-Muslim, but really not, really not following or paying attention to much of the teachings and having a very liberal, open attitude. There's that all the way to ISIS, for starters, and there's also the fact that um, religious people who are 
very religious and devout are absolute masters at all forms of mental gymnastics. Yeah. So um, even if you ask the person, is homosexuality evil? And they tell you yes. Um, even then you can't, you don't know where that answer is precisely coming from. So do they really believe that? Or do they just think that's what that's what they should believe, right? Because it's in their holy book. Um, and how they uh, expand know, on that really, rhetoric is different too. And like, how how do they live that out? Do they kind of ignore that, or are they? You know, it's really really hard to tell. And so I feel that you can't. Um, there's no simple way of of characterizing Muslims. What you need to do is just get as many people as possible, Muslims and everyone else, away from the devout and um, very observant, very traditional, very conservative side of things towards the more liberal side of things. Yeah. And I agree with that. I think that people's just general perception of Muslims is so... It's so tainted by our, our media and the way it's portrayed, not just on the religious level, but just on the cultural level of the whole situation of the Middle East since 9-11 specifically, but even before that. And I think that for a lot of people and how they understand the the history and the geopolitics of the Middle East is so... It's just lacking so much nuance, and it's so reactionary depending on where you're getting your media from. And I think that is where you get a lot of this tainted um, ideological mess from people who just are are being racist you know, or anti or are anti-Muslim bigots in some capacity. Right. You know. Right. I mean, I think that. I do think, um, you know, I'm very, very much against the religion, and I do see it as a kind of pernicious mind virus. Um, although, you know, it's also, even there, it's possible to practice Islam and for it to be um, completely not only harmless, but just a beneficial thing mm -hmm. in your life. So there are certainly ways of doing it that are not, that, that, you know, leave out all of the bad stuff. And religious people, many religious people cherry pick. That is also a very common yeah. way of using religion. Um, so I have certainly come across people like that and who just, you know, politely, discreetly ignore all of the not so savory stuff. Um, but I do think it is a, that religion is a big problem, that specific religion in particular uh, globally. Right. Uh, in some local places, it's not the main problem, but yeah. globally speaking, and at this point in history. So um, it doesn't need to be a competition between religions. We don't have to worry about which is worse on a kind of general philosophical scale. Just right now at this point in history, looking all across the globe, Islam is the biggest problem. In India, no, in India, um, it's Hindu extremists who are the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then in America, you've uh, got your Christian fundamentalists. And in America, you've got Christian fundamentalists. Yep. You know, I don't know how huge a problem they are, but they are a problem. Oh, they're a problem. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that you have to separate out. And some of the rhetoric, I feel, is very, very extreme. Um, I mean, I... I kind of, un I understand in, that there is, I feel there is really a place to criticize the religion very, very harshly, um, in the harshest possible terms. But I think you have to be careful about how you then apply that to people. Yeah. So, for example, if you take little girls in hijab, uh, and I absolutely I really hate the whole, I really, well, I, I, I actually quite like hijabs on adult women. They can look very nice. Um, and, you know, I have no problem with any particular woman who is wearing a hijab. And I've met really nice hijabis. Um, but I hate the whole idea of the hijab, the modesty culture, and particularly for children. Mm. Um, I, But at the same, and I understand that, you know, there is a kind of, pernicious idea behind the teaching, which is that 
it's to cover up, to be less sexual and therefore not to tempt men. So when you're putting your hijab on, I've seen hijabs on babies in prams, you know, who are too young to walk. So at some level, it feels as though you are buying into that sexualization from a really young age. So it's a sexualizing of children. But at the same time, I don't think that the mother who put that hijab on her daughter is actually thinking you are already a sexual being and you know need to be kind of covered up or right. the men are going to or the other muslim men are going to want to rape you i you know that is that is a bridge that is too far that's not how people think they think you know she's going to grow up and wear hijab so we'll start her off wearing hijab early yeah um they're not think they're not thinking in in some kind of pedophile terms. And I think it's very misleading to say that, you know, just like it's it's, um, technically speaking, um, Mohammed was a pedophile. But at the same time, I don't think, you know, people who are following Mohammed's example as the perfect man, they are not thinking in terms of him being a pedophile. And in fact, arguably, in that in that age, in that region, um, his behavior was normal. Yeah. And not so, justifying it, but just that's just what yeah, was just happening it, much more frequently on a cultural ex- level. Exactly. So it's not, they're not in any sense um, worshiping or following or endorsing pedophilia necessarily by 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 following him. That's not what they're, you know, that's not the terms that they're thinking in. Yeah. Um, and... So I think there's a real, uh, um, that sort of shift from here's what's literally in the text to here's what uh, I think Muslims are thinking when they read and follow this text, that kind of shift is often just uh, wrong. Right. Um, Just very wrongheaded and misguided. And so much of it does come back down to it, like what are an individual's intentions? Because, I mean, I can speak just to myself personally growing up in an American fundamentalist Christian culture, uh, just on a local level where I grew up. It's very, very rich and deep in um, old school Mennonite. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar. It's just like a, like an, it's an old, old tradition of uh, Christianity, or it's just kind of like, it's almost like moderate um, Amish in a way. Where uh-huh. It's, it's uh, like a lot of people wear like the headdresses and, you know, the old school skirts and everything. And it's very, very modest. And just from growing up in this area, you know, I've, I've had to find myself on the same level as someone who, from a young age, I've been very critical of religion, specifically my religion that I was raised in. And I've found all along the way, you know, from people that I've hurt, directly or indirectly, just how to use my language when I'm talking about it. Because it's sort of like, it's it's inevitable at the end of the day, like if you're going to, if you're going to attack or address somebody's ideology, whether they're a Muslim or a Christian, or even just a Trump supporter, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't attack the person's character to a certain degree, because they attach the ideology to their character. So if you say, Trump is an idiot, then if you're a Trump supporter, a part of you is going to take that personally. And you can't, mm, you mm. can't avoid that at the end of the day, I think. So with a lot of, a lot of the rhetoric that we're talking about, you know, you can't, you, you can be as safe and as well-worded as you can be, but you're, it's never going to be perfect. You're going to hurt people along the way. But I, I really do think that there's, there's just such a predictability in today's climate where if you go on YouTube or you go on Twitter and you type in a search bar, any of the stuff that we're talking about, you can almost tell immediately where somebody falls on the political spectrum just by how they talk about it. And, you know, there are some there's some sort of gray areas like I would consider people like Sam Harris more of a gray area in this because he's he self-identifies as more on the left, but a lot of his criticism aligns with more neocon ideologies, and people on the right are the ones who are often propping up his sound bites, like on YouTube when it comes to this topic, just because it's very aggressive. So there's there's definitely like a, a push and a pull 
with how we perceive um, the way we're like the way others are talking about ideologies and how they affect individuals. On well, a certain level. you know, I mean, I feel I think that if we're just um, sticking with the ideology, so not not going into this kind of attacking of people. Um, which, you know, is the, is the move that the alt-right and far-right and many people on the right immediately do. They go straight from ideology to people. Mm -hmm. It's like a direct arrow. Um, but if you're criticizing the ideology, I think that um, it's actually really um, important, even though I, um, I would never be that harsh, um, I think that it's incredibly important to have um, to have people who are completely frank. Mm -hmm. I.e., yes, it's going to hurt people's feelings who follow that ideology or believe in that religion or um, you know whatever it might be. But it's still very important not to mince words. Right. Yeah, you don't want to and get I, into this language game where you have people on the left who oftentimes dance around a lot of this terminology and they don't want to address it because they don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, I also feel that with religion, um, and there's less so with with the Trump thing, but although I do find the Trump thing quite cultish, it's a little bit like... Um, with free speech more generally, I don't remember the exact phrasing of this image, but um, restrictions on speech are like a kind of giant boa constrictor, and you are inside this boa constrictor, and the people who are saying the really outrageous things, um, they are the ones who are just pushing at the snake. Um, and because they're they're pushing at the snake, they're pushing the boundaries, they're, they're allowing the rest of us inside that space breathing room. Yeah. And I think that that is even more important with religion, that it's very, um, religions are very, very fast to establish taboos on criticism. And once you have that, you have, um, once it becomes impossible to critique it, then the penalties for criticism, even mild criticism, quickly become really, really fear. So I think it's it's very important kind of um, space clearing, mm. um, envelope pushing, I don't know how to put it. It's, you know, people who are um, the Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris's of the world, they are out of the edge of the jungle hacking with machetes. Mm. And if they were not there doing that, we would be overrun with vegetation. Right. Um, that, And I also have noticed that, um, you know, I I feel that, um, though, uh, so, you know, I didn't um, um, grow up with Islam, and I've known many, many really nice Muslims, and I feel like really uncomfortable with a very, very harsh rhetoric. But people who are ex-Muslims, many of them absolutely are huge fans of Hitchens and um, Dawkins, God oh, yeah. Delusion, yeah. and Harris. And to them, if something has been completely taboo, you are never allowed to say what you feel. To have somebody just fearlessly um, letting it, letting rip, that is just, for many people, that is so refreshing and so liberating. Yeah. Um, and the God Delusion has been downloaded, I think, the Arabic translation of the God Delusion has been downloaded more than 10 million times, is that correct? Yeah, something, like, something that. like that. Yep. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, and like, I think, yeah. too, like, I just kind of... Just getting into this a little bit, you're right. Like there's there's there there's a place you know for people who are going to be provocateurs and contrarians and always pushing the boundary. And I definitely think that along with that, then it's it's in a weird way like social media has brought out the best and the worst. But we've brought out 
a culture of um, very analytical self-criticism then because now you have places like Twitter or even like Reddit. Like, I don't know if you've ever been on Reddit before, but... um, No, I have been on Reddit. I'll try and stay off. (laughs) I already have too much social media in my life. Right, right. Well, there's there's like specific subreddits for different, um, you know, people to follow and groups and uh, interests and all that. And if you ever go to Sam Harris's subreddit. It's a really interesting community online. I think there's something maybe like 20 or 30,000 people on it. But it's it's interesting because I, I go there once in a while just to kind of read what they're saying about different uh, speeches he's done or podcasts. And it's very, very critical. You know, it's almost the opposite. I run into this a lot of times on Twitter where if you try to criticize somebody like Jordan Peterson, you get piled on by people that are just going to defend him and say, you're missing the context. And it's, it's very difficult to, to get oh a word my God. in, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've stopped criticizing Peterson because it just gives me a migraine. Yeah, you just you get mobbed. Get. Yeah, and, and and you definitely get that with like I've I've gotten that before with Sam Harris. I've commented on a few of his threads, but not nearly to the same degree. And I think when you when you go to his sub, you really see this self critical group of people who and a lot of them in different threads will get into how, you know, Sam Harris changed their life and gave them the solidarity they needed growing up to kind of get past whatever religious fundamentalism they were raised in. But now they have at they're at a point where depending on what he says, you know, they're much more apt to to criticize him. And it's but it's interesting because there's obviously obviously bad criticism and there's good criticism you know there's people who are just going to troll and you know make absurd claims and take things out of context but then you have like your real fans who when they criticize you they're doing it with the intent to make your work better so it's it's interesting right, right. how you, you kind of have to take uh, both, you know, both of those things with a grain of salt because with someone like Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens, you know, these were these are people who created these ripple effects and did something at a time and place that was necessary for millions of people and helped millions of people get out of, um, you know, situations they were in or helped make them feel like they weren't alone. But at the same time, there's definitely that tendency to then create a savior out of them and, you know, create a savior out of really anyone that we look up to ideologically. And then that sort of mindset creates breeding grounds where you're not allowed to criticize them, which I think is something that we have to avoid when we're talking about any one media group or individual who's, you know, of a power dynamic that is is putting content out there that people consume. Because it's very, very, very easy to just, like, not allow criticism to the people that we like, you know? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I feel that in Hans's case, um, although I was never, um, although I was never, I, I was never religious. Um, and so I don't have that kind of relationship with his work, mm-hmm. but I am an enormous Harris fan. Um, and really, I feel as though... Um, I, it's a little bit like Star Trek also. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course, you can criticize Star Trek, and I can see I can see how all your criticisms have validity, but I don't care, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, um, I, yeah, I got you. <laughs> um, I have a little bit of that feeling towards Harris. So he has done some things more recently that I have not liked as much so i wish he wouldn't do so much what he calls housekeeping yeah i feel that he should just not respond to critics i didn't feel that it was useful to have ezra klein on even though i perversely rather enjoyed that podcast but i didn't think it was a very terribly useful thing to do and I feel that he needs to just ignore the critics, really. Yeah, we have opposite um, takes on this. <laughs> ah, how interesting. But I also, I, I think that some people who dislike him, they, they dislike a sort of philosophical approach to things, mm-hmm. um, which is, um, 
you know, I had an old boyfriend who was a philosopher and he was so annoying. <laughs> it was so hard not to get into arguments with him because he was constantly creating these thought experiments. Yeah, getting into semantics about every little thing. and. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about thought experiments is that you have to take the extreme case yep. in order to make your point. And so... Um, you know, everybody leapt all over Harris when, for example, he said if he had the choice and was able to either eliminate um, religion from the world or eliminate rape, he would choose religion. And people went crazy. I mean, of course, many people misrepresent this totally, saying that he was all in favor of rape. Yeah, right. And I, I feel like those kinds of people, they just don't understand how thought experiments work and how that kind of rhetoric works. That in order to say how pernicious a thing you think religion is, you have to try to compare it to what you think is the second worst thing. Right. Not something you like. You're not going to say, I dislike religion even more than puppies and chocolate ice cream sundays. Yeah. You know, you're going to choose something really really bad. And the same with his nuclear first strike um thought experiment and various thought experiments that he's done. Um this is the classic trolley problem thing. You know, you set up the trolley problem experiment not because you enjoy the idea of killing people. Um but because you 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 say, okay, given these two terrible scenarios, which is the least worst? Yeah. Um, and so I think people are, they don't understand that. And they don't, this way of speaking is not sound biology um, either. It's, you have to hear the entire paragraph to know what's being said. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, uh, uh, his sentences have long syntax. And I think that I, I, Actually, I didn't enjoy it when I was dating someone who did that. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> I would not want to date Harris. But um, I gather he is married anyway. Right. Um, but you know, I, I actually, in Harris's case, I really enjoy hearing that. I love to hear him. I like the kind of courage with which he approaches approaches topics. Right. Um, so I like the fact that you don't have to first think about, well, every little bit of this, if taken out of context and made into a soundbite, sound okay. You know, I mean, half of this podcast would sound really terrible if some creep like Sasha Cyan, uh, some professional um, professional forger like him got hold of it. And you know, yeah, he would just clip out, out a bit, the, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I think he once had this clip of, of Majid Nawaz saying something, and Majid literally said, some people would argue this, but I think those people are really wrong. And then Majid went on to explain what it was they would argue. And Sasha, of course, took out the first bit where Majid said, I think they're really wrong. Yeah. Well, some people just, just don't care. Yeah, yeah. And everybody shared it, including people who knew this was falsified. Yeah. You know, it was so... Annoying. I think that's the it's thing. It's so dishonest. A lot of those people um, don't, they don't even, um, like, it's not necessarily that they don't know what they're doing. A lot of them do know what they're doing, and they see this form of rhetoric coming from this group of people as, in their perspective, to be harmful. So then it just becomes, that's the bottom line for them. Like, they don't really care. It's almost like open mockery, which I think, it's interesting, just going back to talking about these, uh, like, I mentioned that group Chapo Trap House, and, like, how they're certain there's certain groups on the left and on the right like on the right you see this more with like your milo yiannopoulos types or uh, like gavin mcginnis like there's or even trump the hit trump himself is very trollish and you know you see these different um approaches where there's certain groups and certain people within those groups who when they look at the general discourse and dialogue in society they don't see it as as going anywhere you know they see it as this kind of just like boring push and pull and nothing's really getting done and everything is status quo and systematic so like the only way that they can insert themselves to uproot it is to be basically troll and to basically you know take those things out of context and to 
mock, openly mock and joke and really satirize a lot of these issues because they're trying to play. They're basically trying to undermine the systems that are in place. And there's people, this is what you see in the Mm. alt-right. And this is also what you see in like more of like the anarchist uh, socialist leaning left where, and I think, I think motive wise, again, maybe it's just my biases, but I would say that motive wise, oftentimes at least the ones on the left have a little bit of a better motive because they actually like are deeming a lot of these actions and these systems to be harmful. Like if I, I might not agree with like a straight out Marxist on economical, you know, policies per se, but I at least can understand like they see this system in place as harmful and they want to try to implement more government, you know, aided uh, systems to help regulate where things are at. Like I can see where that sentiment's coming from. Whereas oftentimes when I look at a type like Milo Yiannopoulos or uh, Gavin McGinnis, oftentimes I'm seeing or hearing them just talk in platitudes about how to just troll openly and mock people because there's no point in having polite discussions with left people on the left. And it's, it's very much just like creating this environment for free for all trolls. And I think there's a lot of that on both sides where not, not to sound like a, like a centrist, but there's definitely that, um, that attitude on both sides in some capacity where it's just, they don't even care really about getting the facts right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's very true. So I really I think that's why I'm so fond of Harris because I love his um, the scrupulousness um, with which he examines issues and the kind of calm with which he unpicks things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I'm very largely in agreement with his political stances. I think the whole Charles Murray thing was very unfortunate, but I also feel it was very unfairly, extremely unfairly represented. Um, He had two podcasts basically back to back where he talked about, they talked about um, race and IQ, Mm -hmm. the Charles Murray one, obviously. And then after Charles Murray, he had Siddhartha Mukherjee on. Um, they didn't talk for as long about the race IQ issue, but Sid completely disagreed with Char- with Murray and with no pushback from Sam. Sam was just like, OK, that's a very interesting viewpoint. Mm-hmm. But nobody paid any attention to Sid's podcast, which was, you know, really a shame because Sid was wonderful yeah. um, because it didn't it wasn't convenient to them that there had been a counter narrative. Right. Um, and. I think that what happened with Charles Murray is really, I am not a Murray fan at all. And I'm really, I'm not interested in race and IQ questions whatsoever. And I don't think this is, I actually am one of the few people who is rather skeptical about it. I don't think that we, our society is at a stage yet where we can take a kind of snapshot and say, okay, this is definitely genetic. Um, But at the same time, I feel that what the Charles Murray thing was fundamentally about was free speech. And that for Sam and for me too, free speech is the biggest value. Mm. Um, So it's much more important to me that Murray not be shut down because I don't want speech shut down. And whenever I say this, people are like, oh, so ho, 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 you think black people are stupid or something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, that's your obsession. That's what you're interested in. I don't, I don't care about that. I, I care I care about it as a speech issue and that's it. Well, I think that's Um, like that, the way you just framed it right there kind of separates, you know, people who tend to lean more right or lean more left and how they perceive this whole conversation. Because I think for like taking the, um, just while we're on this topic, taking the uh, Sam Harris, Ezra Klein debacle um, as an example here where they, they sort of deconstructed the whole situation with Murray and the bell curve and race and IQ and all that i think from a cultural conversational standpoint this is where we kind of get separated a little bit where i think 
people who lean more right see this whole issue as a free speech issue, like you just laid out. And I think from a fundamental standpoint, obviously that affects uh, all of us across the political spectrum, but people on the right tend to use that as their focal point, as like a baseline when it comes to this. Whereas I think people on the left, or specifically in like the social justice left, they're more so in a place culturally right now where they're trying to prop up different minority groups. So I think with that, you have this kind of talking past each other where, like in that podcast, like just to kind of give like a super, super surface level um, take on it. Like in that podcast, you had Sam who was trying to lay out research that was put made in that book and he was basically saying this is what the research says i don't care about this information but this is what the research says can you concede to these points and then you had ezra klein basically refusing to engage the research and then saying okay well that none of that matters because it's wrapped up in geopolitics and like socioeconomic development over the past several decades of you know oppression of, of black people and how that and then you, you bring up the whole the um what's called the flint effect so there's like all the these different factors where i think you had ezra klein who kind of is more of a representative of social justice leaning leftists who was really trying to focus more on like surrounding context and then you have sam who's much more of a free speech absolutist and was trying to just similar to the jordan peterson uh, podcast he did the first one where he was just trying to nail down the definition of truth and he couldn't oh my god that know? was the worst was, podcast <laughs> ever it was, I mean, this I, was very similar just, to that i just can't stand uh, well i can't stand peterson but let's not get into that <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> but, it, but it was very similar in the sense where sam was trying to establish basically like a baseline for them to go off of and they couldn't get there and that's definitely fought on both of them i think just as they, they could have really use some some moderator or somebody who was able to kind of like help navigate the context that they're both bringing to the table but i think that is where the this this sort of cultural conversation at large gets completely separated because like if you if you looked online at the conversations that different groups were having like in the aftermath of that podcast, you had people saying, you know, Sam Harris got destroyed and then people saying Ezra Klein got destroyed. And like both, <laughs> you know, like you had both oh, uh, God, it's sides. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous, but it's it's very indicative of this larger cultural conversation happening right now where like you mentioned like this the social justice left is a phenomenon that you're interested in engaging and learning more about and critiquing and i think that in in, in large is where ezra was coming from in that conversation where he was just trying to mm -hmm. highlight more of these issues that someone like sam doesn't really focus on because someone like Sam is much more focused on for like fundamentals of free speech and criticizing religion. And he has like his sort of niche uh, topics. And that's, I think that's probably in my, in my opinion, that's I think one of the f most fair um, critiques of Sam as a public intellectual. And I, I hate that term, but that's just kind of what he is like as, mm, as someone that's who, what he is. Yeah. yeah. Like as someone who is basically in that category, I think he has a responsibility to use the platform that he has to really expand on as many complex nuanced conversations as he can. And I think that is one area particularly that he has lacked where he, I think, and I think that bec yeah. it's, it's because think, he's, he's oh, sorry, I'll just finish with this. I'm, I know I'm rambling. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, yeah. I think it's because he's so burnt at this point from the characters like Reza Aslan and Glenn Greenwald and now Ezra Klein. And he's kind of, he's been, he's been down this path so many times led by bad actors that I think he's unable to really see across the aisle to anybody who he could have some kind of conversation without it just divulging into what he calls identity politics in this way. Right. I mean, I think that I, I do feel myself also um, that um, it can be very difficult um, to have conversations with people who are from the social justice left mm -hmm. um, because on the social justice left, there's also feeling that among many, obviously not all, but among many, there is a feeling that having a conversation with somebody who has said something problematic or who may 
proved to say something problematic in the future, who is, um, uh, you know, someone who is criticized by the social justice left or even somebody who might be, who's sort of an unknown quantity, mm -hmm. that in itself will pollute you. Yeah. That in itself yeah, is they have bad. Yeah, the, they have the purest test. Right. So that makes it very difficult to have conversations with those people because by definition, um, I am not on the social justice left. And so therefore, by talking to me, they are kind of losing their credentials, their social justice leftist credentials. Mm -hmm. I don't think everybody thinks like this. And we should also be wary of seeing this in terms so much of people Um in, in some cases, there are people who are definitely, they are just social justice leftists. That is their thing. But for other people, it's more of a kind of tendency. Right. So, you know, in some issues, they veer more in that direction and some issues, they veer less, less in that direction. So we can think of it more as a kind of wave, as a movement, rather than as here is this group of people, their team, as it were. Yeah. I have noticed, though, that there is also a kind of tendency, um, I used to think of myself as what used to be called an anti-SJW. Um, nobody is using the term SJW anymore. Um, so I usually call them the woke or the, or the social, <laughs> or now I use social justice left, which is what they, because that's how they refer to themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so you don't get caught up in, you don't have to first have an argument about terminology. Yeah. Um, but the the sort of anti SJW thing, I feel as though the backlash went too far. So you know, to give one example, the Me Too movement. Um, I agree that there are. Um, I've noticed some really worrying tendencies that have come out of not necessarily the Me Too, but th this whole related movement. So, for example, the way in which um, Laura. K was treated um, by her university was absolutely appalling. So she wrote a very nuanced, really fascinating book uh, called Unwanted Advances, mm -hmm. which is about sexual relationships on campus, basically, between um, professors and between junior and senior um, faculty. Um, and uh, various kinds of sexual situations that can occur on campus and people's varying attitudes towards them. And it's a it's just a fantastic book. Um, and she is critical of Title IX um, because, you know, Title IX is universities acting as courts to try rape cases. Right. Um, and how ridiculous is that? So on the one hand, there's no proper standard of... Um, of um, there's there's no proper overwhelming standard of innocence and guilt, so people who are almost certainly innocent are getting convicted. And on the other hand, the punishment if you're found guilty is you're suspended from the college. You know, if the person is actually guilty of rape, they should be in prison, not just you know have to change universities. Yeah, right. So it's it doesn't it doesn't help either. Um, you know, it doesn't help you either accused or victims. It's a completely unjust system. And she said this, and as a result, she herself was subject to a Title IX investigation, and she uh, was in violation of Title IX by questioning Title IX. You know, that how Kafkaesque is that? Yeah, it's just right. absurd. So I can see that some excesses have come out of this. Um, and... But at the same time, I feel like some people in the anti-SJW camp have now become knee-jerk defenders of men in these situations. Right. And I saw this particularly with Kavanaugh, um, that they are sort of championing Kavanaugh just because he's the guy. 
Oh yeah, that you saw that like all throughout this whole reactionary right movement, which is based on YouTube. Any anyone from like the sort of Dave Rubin esque camp, you know what I mean, onward, where you yeah. have all these, and it's and it's so weird. It's very telling too because you don't even have to look specifically anymore at what the uh, actual person is saying. All you can do, all you have to do, is look at what their fans are saying. You know, look at when they post a video about a topic like this. Look at the comments on the video. Look at the Twitter feed. Like you can just see, like the sort of direction the rhetoric has generally moved in in reaction right. to stuff like this. You Although, know? of course, people. I, I mean, I don't hold people responsible for their fans. You really can only hold them responsible for what they say, um, because both fans and detractors can completely. Um, distort what you've said. That's very true, but I think in, um, in their case specifically, like if you look at like just the IDW as a sort of th- group think as a whole, so much of the people in that movement have created the fan base that they have currently. So I mean, like someone like Dave Rubin starting a few years ago, like 2014, 15, when he started publishing the videos he has, you know, a lot of the characters that have come along the way that are in this very long stretch of uh, YouTube and podcasting networkers and just talk show hosts, you know, they're, they all have cultivated this very unique following, which, I mean, obviously you have, you have like people who are fans of say Dave Rubin, but then aren't fans of uh, Sam Harris. Like you have like a lot of, you know, divide right, between them, right. but, like as a, as a general group audience you know they've really just they've developed that audience out of really nothing because there wasn't there wasn't a space I, for it before yeah you know? i have to i have to say i have a lot of mixed feelings about the idw so i'm glad you brought it up so on the one hand um i'm gonna just give some of the positives so on the one hand i think i can see that there is value in the idea that you could have you could model civil discourse between people who disagree mm-hmm. um that that is a nice idea we'll take a group of people who have differing opinions on things and we will show how they're able to talk to each other with civility um that's a that's that's a lovely idea, and I have no doubt that's at least part of Eric's idea. Then there is also need to make money, which I really think there is no shame in. Um, people seem to feel that it's somehow very tacky to make to you know want to make money from your YouTube appearance, your YouTube videos, right, right. and your podcasts and your appearances and whatever. How is that any more tacky than making money by working for Microsoft or being an employee at a bank or, you know, um, or any other corporate job? We all need to make money. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so people have banded together to make money. And they're not, This is these are not super rich people. Um, I mean, some of them have, have now become wealthy. But, you know, it's not... Um, they're not they're not trying to make millions you know it's not it's we're not talking elon elon musk levels of of wealth or warren buffett you know and um so that part is positive also i feel like the fact that they are getting in some cases large audiences i gather that recently this whole these whole talks in Australia, um, uh, some of the talks, the Pangburn thing, there weren't enough audiences, mm-hmm. and the Pangburn guy has kind of gone bust or something. Yeah, I don't know douche. the full story behind care. that. So, <laughs> uh, I don't know what happened with that, but I gather there was just not enough people came or something. Um, so, not always, but the fact that they are very often getting large audiences that you know. People are packing out stadiums to hear philosophical discussions. Mm -hmm. That in itself is also, I think, is also great. Um, So it's encouraging people to consume slightly longer form content and to think about things in the abstract, which I think is good, almost no matter what they are thinking. Just like, you know, I think it's good to read almost no matter what you're reading. But at the same time, I think that grouping together like this encourages lumping and we really really need to get away from lumping and it also i do think that 
Although clearly they do disagree on some issues, and we saw that recently with Kavanaugh. You know, Sam Harris came out very strongly against the nomination. Um, Peterson was kind of dithering, and then he decided he also was against it, I think. Um, Ben Shapiro was obviously supporting it, and the others were kind of more on the fence. And uh, what's her name? Ayanne Hersia Lee came out in in support. Um, So there was clearly a divide there. You know, there are divides on some other issues, but I do think that they have, so they've made a circle of friends, and I feel as though, although it's really lovely to be friends with people you disagree with, it also makes it really hard to criticize them. Um, And sometimes, some of those people I feel really deserve and require quite harsh criticism um, because of the kind of scope of their ideas and the influence they have and you can't do that if it's your buddy right um and i all i already noticed that a little bit in myself because so i um oh and i and it really encourages lumping it makes the the job of people on the social justice left who are really into smearing by association and purity pogroms and things it makes their job so easy you know trivially easy um So I'm accused, you know, I'm accused of supporting things that Ben Shapiro said because I listened to Sam Harris's podcast. Right. You know, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely like some bad overlap, like from people who are just, again, like kind of they're just bad actors and they're they're trolling and they don't really care. They're just like, oh, it's all one thing, you know, and um Whereas I feel completely differently about the different uh, members, so at least the core members. So um, Harris, as I as I said, I like very much and admire, and I'm largely in agreement with, and enjoy. Um, ben Shapiro, I have zero time for. I think he's just a right wing hack. And uh, Peterson, I um, I have occasional. I I do think I don't think he's worthless. You know, I think he has some things to contribute, but I mostly dislike his thinking, his style, his whole obscurantist yeah. gobbledygook Very kind obscure, of yeah, pseudo union right. nonsense. And and I think he's an old fashioned religious conservative, basically. Yeah, that doesn't get talked um, about enough. Yeah, so I'm not. I let's say I am not a Peterson fan. And also, he seems to be suing people now for defamation, which I think is really... Yeah, that's like real free speechy of him. Exactly. So, um, Majid Nawaz, I still largely admire and mostly agree with. I guess he's kind kind of counted as a member. Um, Christina Hoff Summers, I sometimes agree with, but I do find that she's a sort of become a kind of knee-jerk anti-feminist. Yeah. It's it's turned from believe women to believe men, you yeah, know. Right. Um, it's crazy how and, subtle those shifts happen within these groups. I mean, there's a very similar yeah. shift with Dave Rubin, where it started as let's be critical of the left, to all of a sudden the left is evil and terrible, and it's just it's very very subtle how these people change their lines of rhetoric over time. Yeah. Well, I think Rubin's has not been subtle. I mean, I feel and I feel. I really feel Ruben is, I don't know if he is disingenuous or not very bright. <laughs> um, right, yeah. But I, either way, I am not a huge fan of Ruben's. I mean, I don't, Ruben has a platform and I think it's absolutely fine to use his platform. Um, you know, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with going on his show, but promoting him his actual political ideas i think is a mistake yeah um so you know they're a big rag bag rag taggle bag of <laughs> of of people and um and it's become a, just a sort of catch all it's a way of taking somebody who hasn't actually done anything or said anything offensive right and pretending they have by because they're part of this group and somebody else in the group has said something you dislike so it's i think they've really shot themselves in the foot by doing that that's my feeling oh and also the weinstein so um eric i just um i haven't closely oh are you okay there yeah, yeah i'm right here yes yeah, so eric and brett 
So, Eric, I have not followed at all, and I so I don't really, um, I don't find Eric's way of thinking very easy to follow, uh, you know, to to grasp, to understand yeah. what he's about, um, and I haven't followed him closely at all. So I just have nothing to say about Eric. I don't know, you know, I would have to follow, um, and I and I'm personally really fond of Brett and Heather. Um, I really like them. And I actually notice the whole problem that I can see with the IDW, even in myself, mm. that if Brett says something really objectionable, I just don't feel like I'm going to go on Twitter and uh, attack it. Yeah. Um, because um, he and Heather in particular have been uh, really sweet. You know, I like them. Um, I consider them kind of friends. I mean, I haven't met them, but I consider them sort of friendly, supportive people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's very difficult. I have committed by joining Aru. I kind of committed to being able to support whatever Helen says and does, mm -hmm. uh, Helen Pluckrose. And um, I feel fair, pretty confident that I can, having followed Helen for, you know, several years um, and having disagreed with her in various things, but never in such a way that I felt, you know, what she had to say was egregiously bad. Right. It's just an ordinary difference of opinion. But you do have to be really careful of, of um, who you kind of team up with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's there's a lot to uh to respond to and all that, but I'll just say this. I think I think uh, going back to something we talked about a little earlier when we were talking about um, Islam and how we kind of have to take case by case with individuals and sort of parse out their beliefs and their intentions and all that. I think this is almost my take on the intellectual dark web is almost the flip side of that, where it's not necessarily that intentions don't matter because they definitely do on an individual level. Like if somebody's using malintent, then we want to know about that. But I think on the broader scale, because these are people with massive platforms, I think it's much more interesting because, because neither one of us are mind readers and like, we're never going to, Unless, you know, unless there's some ultra transparent future ahead where we can know everything about the intentions of the people in this group or just in general, like there's not really a way that we can tell what their motives are at the end of the day. Right, right. But, but I think like if we can just take what they're saying and what their platforms represent at face value here, I think this is where it kind of gets interesting because there was that whole, like a few weeks ago, or it might have been a couple months ago at this point, I can't recall, but there was that whole... Uh, uh, data and Society Research Institute uh, paper that came out. Did you follow this at all? Where it had the the graph of the um, the YouTubers with the reactionary right and this whole like the Vox oh, article got um, written yes. about it. Yes, in fact, I didn't follow that. I only saw the Claire Voltaire on Twitter. Uh -huh. I think that's not her real name. She um, did a spoof of it of okay. leftists, and the spoof was taken seriously for about a day. Everybody <laughs> was sharing it, and all people on the social justice left were kind of up in arms about it and right wingers were really kind of <laughs> gleeful um, but she had just invented it the leftist version <laughs> oh that's funny yeah but it, it was it was an interesting like I didn't read the entire report but I read a little bit into it and followed some of the, the sort of like mechanisms of how they got the information they got and just for people listening just to provide like very minimal context here basically the uh, the purse the people who put this paper together strung together a bunch of different um, sources, primarily on YouTube, um, and found just how like certain uh, pages and people connect with each other. And like, I guess the, I'm not sure if there was like a pre um, preconceived premise going into it. And they were just trying to like you know um, justify their biases, or if they genuinely went into it trying to figure out the end cause. I'm not really sure, but either way, like they basically the paper was just showing a diagram of like you have your your channels of information like a Dave Rubin and then a Jordan Peterson and like a Steven Crowder or a Ben Shapiro and then there's these sort of like as you kind of go further down the diagram you get into more alt-right uh, fascist types where you get into like your 
Mike Cernovich and your Stefan Molyneux and even even further down the line into like your uh, Jared Taylors and um and all and all, all those types. So needless to say, people on the in this sort of intellectual dark web movement were very upset because it basically associated them by like a couple degrees off of Nazis. So there was a very much of like the a public uproar and Vox did a whole piece on it and all that. But all that to say, what's in, what's what I took personally because I work in social media marketing. So like what I took personally that was uh, interesting about this whole thing is the algorithms that are in place on YouTube particularly because with these groups, you know, you have your channels like like say you have Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro and then you have Jordan Peterson. And if each each one of those three has their own separate channel, but then they all cross-pollinate and they go on each other's shows, then you're shifting your audience to each other. So it is this very interesting thing where YouTube's algorithm then, depending on the content that you like, it can lead you down this rabbit hole, which I think a lot of people we've seen who have, have become more closely tied to the alt right uh this is very like slippery slope for some and like i don't and i don't buy the whole you know like if you listen to dave rubin you're going to end up a neo-nazi it's not it's it's like people who say if you start smoking pot you're going to end up doing heroin like it's not you're, you're going to end up like joe rogan yeah right. if you start smoking pot <laughs> yeah you'll end up on dmt so it's like it's it's definitely a uh it's not like a, a complete causal effect but it is interesting when you consider the algorithms in place and how very if you're a young impressionable kid and you start on one of these channels it really isn't that long until you have the potential to lead down one of these roads and all that is interesting to say because it's not not a it's not a catch-all saying that you know dave rubin is a nazi but it is saying that the people who run these platforms have a responsibility to monitor the guests that they have on and how that's going to affect the cross-pollination of audiences because it's really i think i mean i think we're really thinking about um rubin and and rogan here Mm -hmm. and people who have that kind of podcasting platform You know, I also am a free speech absolutist, but I do think that if you are defending absolute free speech, then there are also responsibilities that come along with it, moral responsibilities. They shouldn't be legal ones. Mm -hmm. Um, I would be opposed to them being in some way forced legally, but you have moral responsibilities to counter bad speech when you find it. Right. Um, So I think that... You can either, um, if you are not the kind of person who is good at doing a more um, confrontational interview, then then you have to be choosy about your guests um, and, you know, choose guests who you think that you can, whose views you can endorse. Or if you, if you want to have conversation with ev- anyone, then you have to at least do a David Pakman style right. yeah, interviewing. Right. Um, where you are, where you push them on their views, where you offer them pushback and challenge, and you highlight their more problematic things if they're trying to hide those things or whitewash them yeah. on the show, you know? Like David Packman's um, with uh, Richard Spencer is a great example of that, where it's, he had on Richard Spencer, who's just a white nationalist, which is basically just rhetorical lingo for neo-Nazi, and he just did a great right. he did a great job highlighting just the sort of nuanced rhetorical tricks that someone like Richard Spencer is really good at implementing to obscure language and to pivot off certain topics, and he didn't let him just like, he didn't let Richard Spencer dictate the direction of the conversation. He had to, he made him confront the ideas. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that those are your two choices. When it comes to being a guest on a podcast, it's a little bit trickier. And I think actually that I, um, so Douglas Murray was once asked why he went on uh, Stefan Molyneux's Mm -hmm. uh, podcast. And um, Murray said, I will go on anybody's podcast. Um, And I think that that is probably the best attitude to take. Because otherwise, you you just do not know what your host will do in the future or who else he will have on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's fine to disseminate your views anywhere. Yeah. But I think if you're the host, then you do have a duty to either choose carefully, choose people you can endorse, or 
um, to to question and challenge. And of course, it's not a perfect system. So sometimes, you know, you may have somebody on and you may not realize they have some really, really unsavory opinions. Right. Um, and you may not discover them in the course of the conversation. So, you know, we're going to log off today and you are going to discover that I'm secretly a member of the Ku Klux Klan and you didn't know that and you never questioned me about it on this in this right. interview. <laughs> I'm I'm sure that Sasha Cyan is going to like quote mine that part. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's going to go viral everywhere. But um, I am joking. I'm joking, world. Um, but you know, you can't always know. You know, it's not perfect. But I think that you should at least attempt to find out. Um, and if you do know, you should certainly you should certainly not let pe- unsavory people give their own sanitized account of themselves yeah you should push them you should at the very least get those you know you should the very least open the bedroom door and show people the knickers drying on the radiator (laughs) that's a great way of putting it yeah i i I absolutely agree i and i mean it's it's such a especially with just how i mean everybody it's so it's become so cliche in today's climate to use terminology like polarizing and tribalism and echo chamber but we we really do it's it's you know it's become cliche because it's true you know we're we're in such a a very strange time societally where you know each each person who is going on these platforms or creating these platforms really has to think think critically just about how they're going to come across and how who they are as a person where their convictions lie and like you talked a little earlier you know yeah, I you know, I kind of disagree about thinking critically about how you're going to come across because I feel that um you have to just be as frank as you can mm. and as explicit and clear as you can and if you get people who are unsavory people supporting you and you know that then you have to distance yourself from them. Yeah. But I don't think that there's anything you can do to stop unsavory people from supporting you. And I think this kind of adjacency thing, which we were talking about earlier with a kind of web of of right-wing YouTubers, that is also really everybody is adjacent to everyone else. Um, You know, you can trace some line that goes from you to ISIS. That is how things are situated, you know? Everything is next to something else. Um, But being adjacent is not necessarily being the same thing. And sometimes the the right thing is adjacent to the wrong thing. Mm. Sometimes the truth is adjacent to something very wrong. So, you know, for example, um, I really think it's true that conservative traditional Islam is a deeply misogynistic, homophobic retrograde, um, life-denying form of belief. And that that opinion of mine is kind of adjacent to people who dehumanize and hate Muslims. Right. But that doesn't mean it's the same. Right. And how, I um, think and I think how we draw we have to be able to draw those distinctions and really flesh out the nuance and how we are being perceived though, which I guess I guess that is where I'm coming from when I say critical thinking just because in my mind it's very easy like you talked earlier in the podcast we were talking about how there's certain uh, individuals out there who are very set on building a brand online and they're very set on you know this is what you got to say this is what you don't got to say and they're very careful about who they are in that way whereas I guess what I'm saying is almost the opposite where I'm, I'm saying yes be very critical of how you're coming across but do so in a way that you're paying attention to your audience and you're paying attention to how people are perceiving your words because at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to stop the trolls and the people that are always going to take things out of context, but you can provide as much separation as you can from like... like You can... I I think you can kind of answer back. Um, So... I think you should say what you have to say as plainly, as honestly, as sincerely mm. as you can without worrying about how it's going to be perceived. I mean, obviously, whenever you say something, some part of you is thinking about how to phrase it in such a way that it right. will be correctly perceived, but without being paranoid about how it's going to be perceived. 
let me say. Yeah. And then if you get a reply from somebody saying, oh, you meant this, and they have misinterpreted, then then you clarify. Right. But I don't think you can control how people read you yeah, and I agree or how that. they perceive you. Yeah. And I feel as though um, on the social justice left, there are a lot of people holding people responsible and and smearing them for the way that they have been perceived, yeah. you know, something over which they had no control. Um, and there's a lot of kind of sense that there are certain things we shouldn't say, even certain topics we shouldn't discuss, because um, other people will take them and run with them and use them as ammunition for their own cause, which we don't agree with. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's I like think where you get that's, taboos and that's not good. Yeah. That's not good. And I think it's a very weak position also. It's like we must hide these things because yeah. if people know the truth, they will use it. That's not a stable that's not a stable situation. You can't hide the truth like that. Yeah, you're basically expecting you're you're basically assuming that everybody is a child and that they can't think for themselves and it's very poor assumption making. Yeah, it gives it puts you in a very weak position also because people are gonna discover the truth. Yeah. And when they do, they're gonna be annoyed that you lied to them. They're not going to trust you anymore. Um, and, you know, this is just, it's um, its not worth it. Yeah. Even though some of the truths you say, other people are going to take that and use it for their argument. But you can't help that. You know, I think that that's not something that you can have control over or ought to get too paranoid about. Yeah. With today's climate, I mean, we really have... Everybody is just reacting to everybody else. And like you see it from Trump supporters who, you know, in their their view, they are reacting to eight years of Obama. And then you have these social justice movements who then say they're reacting to Trump's election. And then you have the alt right saying like they're reacting to the social justice movement. So it's like you really have to be mindful in, in how you you use your your rhetoric and how you approach these different people with different platforms and just how you take your information in. But we, you're right. Like we should all, we should treat each other like we're adults. Like we can handle the truth and that there's not, there's no reason to just kind of beat around the bush with certain stuff just because we're no, afraid, and it's, you know, it's very counterproductive. People do not like being condescended to. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, I mean, like let, we can wind down here cause we've been going on mm -hmm. for a little while, but I mean, mm -hmm. with all the, yeah, I've been, talking your ears off no i love Sorry. it no no you're, you're, this, this has been great i really appreciate the time so i mean like with all that said like do you in your work do you see a solution to this sort of pattern of reactionary movements is it is it in the rhetoric that you've been using tonight like is it just this uh this more we need to use more nuance or do you have anything in specific you think is good um you know one of the things that i hope that we can do with ario um, and I'll just, I'm just going to plug ARIO for a moment. Yeah, sure. Um, because we can only do this with ARIO if we get reader support. Um, we're absolutely, we do have a few other sources of startup funding, which are going to run out, but we need to become financially self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So if you are listening and you want to, um, you want ARIO to um, continue to be a a good platform for this kind of discourse, then you need to go to our Patreon and throw us a few dollars a month, just five dollars a month, even, you know, every, even one dollar a month, every little counts. And if you can't do that, then spread the word to those who can. Retweet, share. If you, if you, if you care about this kind of thing, you need to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, I couldn't agree um, more. You need to put some skin in the game, at least the skin of a few little greenbacks. <laughs> um, having said that, this is the kind of thing I would like to do um, to increasingly be able to do with ARIO and with the podcast, um, which is to provide a space where people are calmly discussing um, philosophical topics related to politics and society. Um and which is nonpartisan. Mm. So um, we are 
I would say that we have had a lot more left-leaning con contributors than right-leaning um, because um, Helen in particular, and to a lesser extent me, we are the face of ARIO and we ourselves are, are very left-leaning and we're not going to ha conceal that. But our wish is to have a balanced media and uh, we have certainly published articles that we don't that we don't agree with ourselves, mm. as long as they are a valid way of looking at, at the issue. So if they are carefully, clearly, and calmly argued, without cheap gotchas, without name calling, without mind reading or demonizing the other side, right. um, well written and interesting, uh, then we will publish them. Um, we've had a couple of pieces that had a slightly more partisan feel, um, but in general, the pieces we have published have been very calm in their approach. Um, and in fact, um, when I'm editing, if I come across people being sort of more strident, I usually remove the stridency from the article before it goes out. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> I would like the kind of article that you are being, for example, we've had a few conservative writers in ARIO, and then we have um, a, quite a few more left-leaning people. Um, I think uh, Ralph Leonard is probably the most left-wing of our regular contributors and one of my favorite writers, and much more further left than I am. Um, but you should be able to read an article by Ralph if you are on the right or an article by a conservative writer if you are on the left and not feel this is a load of, you know, partisan tendentious bullshit. Right. Yeah, like a bunch should of be, hyperbole. To, and... Yeah, you should be able to disagree but not feel that your arguments have been completely straw manned. Yeah, it's it's such a trade off because you really you know, people want to be entertained. They want their emotions to be invoked when they read something and that's where a lot of the biggest media outlets they get their money because they're they're using those buzzfeed esque titles and they're really pulling people in by their you know, their partisan biases and it's right. really it's very difficult yeah. to establish I want to Oh go ahead. Yeah. I wanna stay away from clickbait. Yeah. Um, and for it to be this calm, measured, where people are talking about the ideas um, and where you can be exposed to a range of ideas. And we've had some really excellent pieces, but the more sub reader support we can get, the better quality the magazine is going to be, because then we will have more time to dedicate to editing and we'll be able to um, we pay our writers, but we'll be able to pay our writers better. And so we'll be attracting a larger number of contrib contributions. But that's what I would like to see grow, that platform. That's awesome. Um, it's, it's great and that with you're it, able to offer with that. With its accompanying podcast also. Uh, check out the podcast at 2 for T. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to advertise a oh my gosh, yeah, podcast on here. You are competitive. <laughs> no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. I'm, I'm independent. We can do whatever we want here. So no, I love <laughs> okay. it. And I, and I really I appreciate the, the level of nuance that you're trying to bring to this because it isn't it's not a, you know, anytime you fall into those more buzzy um, partisan categories, that's where you get the most funding. And it's very difficult to be listeners and, and viewers support supported in a in a landscape that really doesn't um it, it doesn't we it's not supported as well you know and it's really i think it's great yeah. that you're really trying to produce content we that need, does more for that we need to depolarize and i mean ario is not a kind of i mean helen and i both write op-eds for ario um frequently but it is not primarily just a vehicle for my opinions it's mostly not my opinions right um you know it's mostly people making arguments that i don't always agree with that come from a different slant from the one that i would take that are on topics that don't um that aren't the topics that i am most passionate about it's not it's not me in digital form or Helen and I in, in digital form. It's a platform from which to have a kind of calmer 
from which to start a calmer place of discourse and conversation. Cool. Love it. Thanks so much again for doing this, Iona. I really appreciate all your insight and all the time to uh, pull all this together. My pleasure. 